Welcome and welcoming Kevin Koppelman, Director, Cowan & Company. Brian Nowak, Managing Director, Morgan Stanley. And Eric Sheridan, Managing Director, UBS. All right, it's great to have you all here with me this morning. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's get right to it. Uh, first question for you. Online travel growth slowed down over the last year here. Are we in the middle, middle innings for the space? Is it maturing? Is it share loss or something else entirely? Eric, let me start with you. Yeah, I think it's a combination of things. I think as we look at the sector, there's definitely some signs of maturation, especially in the, in the developed world, in the hotel vertical. The hotels themselves are taking a little bit of share back of online versus offline. That's impacting growth. And Google's product innovation at the top of the funnel is reducing some of the points of friction that allow other players to come into those auctions. I think yeah. you add all of that up, it's creating some headwinds to growth. Yeah, right. I think, you know, the, I, I agree with Eric. And the, the other way to sort of think about it is we, it's a more penetrated category relative to e-commerce, relative to online advertising, where essentially, you know, somewhere in the, the mid to high 40s percentage of room nights are booked online at this point in the leisure space. You've seen the OTAs take a lot of share over the last few years. And ultimately, there just are sort of ceilings to that second derivative pace of growth. I, I would just add, you know, these are huge companies. So we found that the top five OTAs are generating about 200 billion just in lodging related bookings this year. Uh, they're still growing much faster than the overall market. And in our survey data uh, for the US, we found the OTAs have about 33% of nights. So still a lot of room, but they are very large. So we've talked a little bit about what you think has happened. I want to talk about what you think is going to happen as we look forward in time. When you think about the growth profile for this space over the next several years, are we talking single digits? Are we talking double digits? And uh, Brian, let me start with you on that. So the, the overall online travel space, <coughs> we think, continues to grow in the, the double digits globally. Yeah. Um, and I think the, within that double digit growth, we think the online travel agents continue to take share. Um, but we still do think that despite where penetration is, it's still a double digit growing overall online space, much faster than overall demand. Um, and I think sort of the, the wild card is sort of how do we think about alternative accommodations and the impact on that. But if you just focus on hotels, it's still a double digit grower in our view. Yeah, is everyone in agreement on the double digit versus single digit? I would say there's, there's a little bit of a debate between high single and low dibble in my mind, just because I think you are seeing some pretty big pivots in the industry of how they want to spend marketing dollars and what they hope to derive from those marketing dollars. So we're seeing one of the more seismic shifts of performance marketing, buying leads, converting leads, moving to brand advertising dollars, building direct traffic, building brand awareness, how those dollars turn into conversion against Brian's point around shared accommodation, taking some incremental share of the industry growth, I think that could probably tip you one way or another between high single and low double digits. I, I'm probably on the higher end on this stage, and I, we have a 13% caker at the top five OTAs in lodging. Um, and I, I think if you look over the past year, uh, there was a little bit of overreaction because you had the pullback in ad spend, yeah. and so growth looked a little bit slower. But if we go back on the stage a year ago, I think the conversation was 10 to 20 percent, where do you fall? So right. it's clearly, ha on a percentage basis, has changed. Now, I've probably asked this question every year for the last 10 years, and I, I suspect every year for the next 10 we'll be asking the same thing. So Google. Um, it does seem as though we've seen an, an acceleration of iteration in their travel vertical product. Looks like they're maybe gaining some momentum. Where do you see them in the next several years? Are they friend? Are they foe to the incumbents in the space? Kevin? Well, it's, it's a frenemy relationship, as has been described uh, often. But at the, end, at the end of the day, it's still symbiotic, especially if you look at um, the relationship between Google and booking. Uh, we found that. Together, the two of them account for about 85% of profit at the EBIT level um, among the online travel companies. Uh, and that's out of a, a pool of about 10 and a half billion that they're all generating. Uh, the, ultimately, the online travel agents, we believe will continue to, to uh, collect the vast majority of the leads for the foreseeable future from Google. Any thoughts on Google? I mean, this, this is one of the key points of tension in the, in the space, right, where ultimately for, for Google, 
they need to continue to find ways to drive higher monetization within the travel vertical. You, know, you see them develop new products, develop better targeting, develop do, n new ways to pull in more dollars and really push down any of the organic reach in the search results, almost forcing the online travel agencies and the other players to spend more. They're going to keep doing that. At the same time, you know, you're, you're hearing booking and you're hearing Expedia saying, you know what, we got to focus more on branding, developing our own brand, and trying to become more like an Amazon and direct destination so for people to book travel. So I think that's going to sort of be one of the big points of tension that we see over the next couple of years as the OTAs are going to try to become bigger, quote, brands, and Google's just going to keep finding ways to monetize the clicks. Yeah, I think we get asked all the time, is Google becoming an OTA? And yeah. I think I've written... Po very a, popular question. Yeah, I think I've written about a dozen times now the answer is no, right? Because if you define an OTA as booking agent, managing inventory, credit card transactions, customer service, we pretty consistently hear from folks in the industry that's not where Google's going. Yeah. But there are aims Google has that lines up well with the industry, and there's aims Google has that lines up well for Google, right? Reducing consumer friction, uh, improving conversion, you know, getting more marketing budget from their partners, d deepening their auction. Some of those things line up very, very well with the goals of the OTAs, and some of them don't. And, and let's talk about uh, you know what's being talked about really here at the conference, which is the book on Google. Yep. This is a product that was originally launched in 2013, so it's actually been around for a long time. And you know, we think as long as it's in that tertiary position below the AdWords, below the hotel price ads, that it's a smaller part of, of the whole there. Not a risk that ultimately we commoditize the OTA, right? If, if you're going to start on Google, you're going to book on Google, and the OTA is going to handle all the back end work, right? The fulfillment, the customer service, the lower margin stuff. Is that a risk for the OTAs to participate in a product like that? Well, it, it's a risk. Right now, it's, uh, I think it's a small percentage of the yep. total. So until we see it becoming a bigger percentage of the total or gaining a priority over the price comparison ads, over the ad words, then it's, it's really probably not, not a huge risk. Well, so, and, uh, go ahead. No, I was, I was just gonna add, I think what you hear from the OTAs is if somebody's sort of encroaching on our space, coming closer and closer to what we do, uh, and our goals don't align with theirs, we're willing to pull back on performance marketing, right? You've seen that in the meta space over the last 12 months. I think Google is sort of getting up to that line to some degree, to where there's some questions about how those goals align with each other, and that's going to be, how that plays out is going to be you know, important for both sides. And ultimately, I think the consumer is going to, going to decide. If Google shoppers like the booking experience on Google and they're converting at very high rates, it will get moved up. Historically, that has not happened to date. It doesn't mean it won't happen in the future, but it has not really happened with Google or with anybody else who has tried it. So I want to shift gears a little bit. A name we haven't talked about in each of the last bunch of years, uh, but seem to be talking a lot more about now is Amazon. Uh, do they need to be? Do they want to be in travel? And if they do, how do they get in there? Are they going to build it? Are they going to buy it? Uh, Eric, or, I'm sorry, Brian, let me start with you on that one. Yes, yeah, so we, wrote, we wrote about this earlier in the year about essentially why Amazon should get into travel. Um, so I think they should. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons. You know, one, it's a, it's a big addressable market. When you think about you know, the, the core $2.5 trillion of spend that Amazon attacks in US PCE, and even you know, $4.5 trillion outside the US adding in travel, it's a big number. Um, secondly, it's, it's an asset light industry. You know, it's, it's a lot easier to book a hotel or a flight than it is to ship a canoe and a kayak, yeah. right? Or get your bananas in two minutes. Um, so it's, it's asset light, it's a big TAM. It's also an important data set. When you think about Amazon, a lot of what they're trying to do is they're trying to create a very personalized, curated experience for you every time you go on there. That's why grocery is so important because of the high frequency. Travel is a blind spot for them. They don't know about travel, so they, they need that data, I would argue. And lastly, you know, it kind of going back to that point of brand loyalty and where people start, um, I, I still think it's going to be challenging for the OTAs to an extent to really change behavior a lot and get people, stop them to going to Google. However, Amazon, with the fact that over half of US retail queries now start on Amazon as opposed to on Google, they do have a great brand. The Prime members are incredibly loyal as far as where they start to search for things. And when you think about the economics, you know, the, the OTAs, they are spending somewhere between $10 to $16 in performance marketing per transaction. Amazon, they spend less than a buck. Hmm. I know it's a different gross profit profile of those transactions, but you just sort of think about the idea of leveraging a big, loyal customer base and getting them to book travel, that's a big opportunity. The hardest part, though, is how do you get the supply fast enough? 
know, they've tried this a couple times and they've failed at Amazon. So it's almost going to take a, a partnership with, with one of the OTAs, Expedia is across the road. So, uh, you know, maybe that's a way to kind of build a is partnership. Is it a partnership or is it something they need to, to buy into? I think we heard on the stage yesterday some yeah. opinions about that. Well, it's, I can't put any public any companies in play, um, so I would never say that. But I think the idea of doing a, an affiliate partnership with, a, with one of the OTAs to get access to the inventory, to add that inventory and selection to the Amazon yeah. platform is one way to do it. The, the hard part for the OTAs would be, you know, once you let Amazon under the tent, you just sort of need to make sure that they don't start to steal your customers and ultimately, you know, they become a bigger threat. Yeah. I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I would be surprised if the OTAs would let Amazon in as a partner on their inventory because I think it, there's a pretty long track record now of Amazon sort of rooting out from within industries and sort of extracting all the value while leaving behind a trail of trailing couple of years of transactions and things yeah, like yeah. that, but not a lot of enterprise value. Um, I think Brian's dead right, though. I think that the latter point he made on inventory is the, the whole shooting match. How do you get to scale quickly? You know, do you buy it? Do you build it? Building it at this level of, it, of maturity for the industry would seem tough to go knocking on doors on a global scale to try to do that. So it would probably fit more in a buy versus build decision at this point. I think, like Brian said, I just have no edge whether they would actually do that or not. But it fits yeah. into a lot of what they do in terms of going to market with the consumer. So we've, we've touched on this a little bit already. We've talked about you know, growth maybe slowing down in the space. We've talked about some de-escalation of ad spend, right? We've seen a significant change in advertising strategy from the big online travel agents. I mean, look, they're still going to spend over $9 billion this year, uh, but it's growing single digits. What's led to that change? What are they after with that? Uh, let me give, turn the... Sh sure. I, I think it's really a recalibration. Um, there, was a, there was a period, I think they were dealing with those percentage growth uh, rates starting to come down. Yep. And they were spending a lot. Booking and Expedia were kind of feeling each other out uh, competitively, where they were going to gain share, how that was going to play out. And it was just too much spent. Um, Through a Trivago in the mix, which was growing very rapidly. Uh, and they, they just saw too much of their profits going downstream to the ad partners, and they, so they, they pulled back. It was led by booking um, a little bit over a year ago. And I think all the companies that have engaged in this have been generally happy with the results. I think there's been, among the investment community, maybe not as happy as we've come to grips with a little bit slower growth rates, but uh, they found that they're getting a lot of direct repeat business back and that they're able to get most of those leads while paying a little bit more money, yeah. a little bit less money, excuse me. Any thoughts? This is a big debate among investors, you know, the finding of inefficiencies at this point of the industry penetration curve, you know, so how, how long can you keep finding inefficiencies in your marketing spend? Because it also begets a little bit of what were you doing on your marketing spend two, three, four, five years ago that it was so inefficient that you're still finding them now in 2018, 2019. So I, I agree that there's probably some efficiencies they'll still find. I think the bigger debate that ends up leading to ROI and margin structure in the industry is how successful the OTAs are at driving direct traffic through brand advertising. You know, that is long duration marketing spend. It's not buying Google search and being able to pull the lever and see a lead yeah. produced tomorrow. So you're, you're making a 6, 12, 18 month bet on, on realigning the way traffic comes into you as a platform. I think that's the bigger swing factor for capturing a, the right matrix of revenue growth versus margin expansion for the industry as I look out over the next couple of years. I agree with them. <laughs> and and from, a, from a market perspective, you know, we've always sort of favored room night growth over, over margin growth, and, and we see valuations follow that. What do you think about that dynamic? Is that dynamic going to change? Because obviously we've seen a trade-off, you know, room nights for margin, and it hasn't been a great thing for the stocks. Yeah, this, this is one of the big debates we've had in the, in the sector this year where, you know, we, we sort of are entering a little bit of a, of a GARP debate, you know, growth at a reasonable price versus, you know, room nights, room nights, room nights. Because if you look at sort of the, the room nights that have been delivered, they have been lower than expected, but the actual cash flow has not been, as you've seen some of the optimization that, you know, we've all been talking about. Yeah. And so I think going forward, the, the online travel agents are essentially, they're going to kind of thread the needle on both metrics. You know, I think the, the key is to sort of maintain double-digit room night growth and probably uh, teens 
cash flow growth in order to sort of like get, continue to get investor endorsement in the stocks because the, the double digit room night growth, 10 or 11, it's fine as long as the companies can show as we're doing that, we're also finding ways to become more efficient in our ad spend, whether it is through more direct traffic or eliminating other inefficiencies. So the, the earnings growth has got to outpace the room night growth if we're going to be in the slower growth world. Yeah, to follow up on that, I mean, I think the, the sort of nexus of the argument is can they beat on revenue and beat on EBITDA at the same time? Yeah. Or, or is this an industry where if I push in on marketing, I'll beat on revenue and room nights or not? And, and I think if you, not to put it in too much investor language, but what investors tend to want to pay higher multiples for and value more highly are companies that can do both. Um, so I think if it's just a trade-off, that's results in a lower multiple that investors are willing to pay for the industry. And that's, so I think that debate, to Brian's point, is the key one over the next two years. Which way do we fall out on that debate? And, and so, I, I think anyone can. Yes, got a question from the floor. Uh, what are your thoughts on the investment and valuation environment outside of the US, especially with SoftBank and Alibaba throwing in half a billion, billion dollars? What does that mean to access to entry, things like that? Well, I would just say, obviously, there's larger pockets of growth in the developing world than there are in the developed world. So when you see pockets of growth like that, 20, 30, 40 percent plus in some of those regions, that obviously the debate becomes less about what we've just been talking about of what's the right multiple to pay for maturing growth. So you end up getting venture capital money, private equity money tends to flood into those situations ahead of potential IPOs. So I think that's the environment you find yourself in. It's a relatively growth starved global GDP environment. Developing market travel tends to be a lot of growth multiples of global GDP. So you're seeing a lot of investors interested in that area. All right, I want to switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about some model evolution. Um, a bit off script, but one of the things we've, we've seen here this year is a company like Zillow. Used to be a pure advertising model. Now they're a hybrid. They're starting to buy and sell houses. Um, I don't want to talk about that. What I do <laughs> want to talk about is it sort of brings to mind the old argument, uh, argument about an OTA. Should we start thinking about an OTA buying hotel inventory, maybe buying a hotel, maybe even becoming a hotel brand? Um, let me turn that over to you, Kevin, because I know you cover the hotel side as well. Sure, yeah, so we cover the hotels and the OTAs. I think you do see a lot of overlap in their value proposition, but we, do, we believe they're going to uh, continue to go in basically separate lanes, maybe not so much in the alternative uh, side, but uh, our view is that they're both long-term winners. On the hotel side, you have them capturing the heavy business travelers uh, and also convincing more and more owners to join the system with their compelling loyalty programs. On the online travel agent side, they're going to keep getting that leisure traveler uh, and they're going, to, they're going to keep gaining share among uh, not just independents and alternative suppliers, but also small and medium-sized chains. So uh, they're, they're kind of playing off of each other and we think they're both going to do it. At the, at the top companies, they're both going to do very well. And what do you guys think about inventory, buying inventory? Yeah, I think the only problem with that that I would see for the industry, and we've seen it with other two-sided platforms as business models, is the second you go from being a relatively agnostic two-sided platform trying to match up users with supply, and you become the supplier, your other suppliers tend to not enjoy that process. Um, so your negotiation on take rates, your negotiation on availability of inventory likely don't become easier. So you either scale up to be able to offset that impact very quickly, or you're creating an artificial headwind to your business on the inventory side by becoming the inventory. That would be my worry. Yeah, I would expect the OTAs to focus more on product extension than sort of going and starting to, to buy hotels or buy inventory like that. Yeah. You, you, you hear it at the show here with experiences and, you know, Priceline talking about the idea of, you know, experimenting more with flights and trying to find new ways to just extract a bigger share of the traveler's wallet as opposed to starting to buy up inventory. I'd be very surprised. Yeah, and you mentioned experiences, and I want to make sure we hit on some of the trending topics from the conference here. So uh, attractions and activities. Is it a nice to have or a game changer when you think about the incumbents in the space? And are they even the ones you think win in that arena? But, Sir? Yeah. It's, gr it's growing very fast. Um, and it's certainly a, in a really important part of the overall experience. So I think it's probably becoming a need to have for all the major players. It's still at a stage where 
it's just much, much smaller than the hotel side of things. So I don't think it's going to go absolutely to the forefront. Um, but when you have a company like TripAdvisor that's doing extremely well in activities, uh, some of the private players with like a Kluke and Get Your Guide, uh, these are uh, these are companies that are that are showing a lot of growth. And yeah, yeah. I would say great to have, but very hard um, because. You know, you, all of these companies are really in the business of behavior modification and changing the way people do things. And so, you know, the idea of building up a robust enough offering of, select, of attractions and things you can do in market when you're on vacation, and then building an algorithm so you can make it personalized enough so that it's just what I'm looking for when I'm going to Topeka or my mom is going for when she goes to Santa Monica, it's hard. And I think that, that you know, it, it's hard enough to get people to open up the app when they're actually taking the, the trip more or less changing the behavior of how they're actually, what they're doing when they're on the trip, I think it's gonna be very hard, but it's a big opportunity. Yeah, and I wanna, I wanna shift gears a little bit because I wanna make sure we hit on alternative accommodations as well. Um, you know, it's gone mainstream and it's gone mainstream fast, but we are seeing a convergence in some of the underlying product offerings, right? You've got Airbnb adding hotels. We heard Booking tell us yesterday 5.7 million listings and obviously Expedia owns HomeAway. Who's winning as these models converge? Who's poised to pull it out here? Person. I think, well, we've written about it, uh, all alternative accommodations as I think you're, you're currently seeing each company still playing in their own sandbox in a lot of ways. And I think some of those lines are going to start to blur as we get into 19 and 20. You know, there's, there's signs VRBO is going to become more urban. There's signs Airbnb is going to start testing hotels, to your point, Jake. So I think some of the lines are going to blur. The, the, the growth you've seen up to this point has mostly been everyone sort of operating in their pocket of a market called shared accommodations without necessarily running into each other too much. Um, th how they compete against each other as those lines start to blur, you know, that's where I don't think I have a particular edge right now about how those market share shifts are going to play out. Normally when you see heightened competitions and lines blurring in the travel industry, it tends to be a good um, place to be a marketer, like a marketing platform, because it tends to be people amp up the amount of money they need to spend to drive leads to differentiate themselves versus other brands, as opposed to necessarily the unit economics go up for the platforms. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take booking. Um, you know, I, I, we, uh, we have a, we put out, I don't know, I don't know this week on sort of our latest survey data that actually show we, we do think that Airbnb in their oldest markets uh, in, the, in developed Europe and the U.S. is continuing to decelerate um, because of still high concerns around safety, privacy, and just the legality of the product. The, the local municipalities are doing a very good job at pointing out any of the safety, privacy, or just uh, regulatory hurdles here. Um, so we think their business is slowing to the point where um, we think that even booking and Expedia's hotel businesses in the US and in developed Europe are likely to grow faster than Airbnb um, this year and next year. And if you layer on booking and Expedia and sort of what they're doing with alternative accommodations with HomeAway, we actually see the potential for them just to be a better one-stop shop. You know, I think if I'm, if I'm booking a trip to go to the Amalfi Coast, I wanna see how much is the Four Seasons, how much is the Motel 6, how much is that random boat down by the river. And the reality is um, booking.com and sort of what they're, what they're building or Expedia plus HomeAway are actually better suited to do that. And I completely agree with Eric that the, the ability to spend on paid search and bring in traffic and do it efficiently is going to really matter in this industry. And you threw out the $9 billion dollar number before, we completely agree. That is going to be a difficult hill for Airbnb to climb against these guys. All right, so in a parting salvo here, given our time, uh, valuations at multi-year lows, could probably say that for a lot of the market. Are you buying or are you selling online travel right now? Kevin? Uh, we're buying. And which ones? All bookings are top pick, and we have outperform on Expedia as well. Brian? We're buying Expedia over booking, but it's sort of, you know, 1-1-A. One, one uh, I'm more mixed. I would say the, the only one among the developed market OTAs that we're, we're, we have buy rating on right now is Expedia, and that I think is more of a structural, stable growth with headwinds turning into tailwinds on the margin structure of the company being the, the bull narrative around the company. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, Kevin, Brian, Eric Sheridan, thank you. Thanks, Thanks.